Hello and welcome to The Crux. Uh, I'm your host, Adrian Hill, and today I'm delighted to be joined by someone who has recently made the move across the pond from Australia to the UK as part of an exciting new role as the head of partnerships for that region out of the UK and Europe. Uh, my guest has a very unique and diverse uh, and extensive background, filling roles across operations, customer success, as well as sales and partnership uh, leadership roles at companies like Rubler, IntelliHR, and currently at Human Force. Uh, so today we'll be diving into an extremely important topic of partner enablement and how to set our new partners up for success. So I'm extremely delighted to welcome Kate Charge to the show. Kate, welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. How's the trip? Uh, a trip across the pond. How long have you been there for now? Uh, arrived early August, um, so still relatively uh, new. Unfortunately, we are missing the Australian summer and came into the end of the UK winter, which is basically Brisbane summer, yeah. uh, Brisbane winter rather. Um, so no, it's been really, really good though. It's definitely a, a big learning curve kind of jumping into a new space, um, well, not necessarily a new space rather, but the same space in a completely new environment where the market's different, the maturity is different. It's just a really interesting change yeah absolutely and we'll touch on that a little bit later on because i can i can only imagine having worked in the uk briefly in different roles it is a huge a, a huge shift especially post covid i would imagine so but you know we've got plenty to cover off but why don't we start by sort of giving the viewer a bit of a, a background or synopsis on on your history to date and, and how you ended up uh in your role currently yeah sure look um, I do have a bit of a, I guess, a unique one. Um, I guess my, a lot of my career started early sales, doing education, things like that. And then I jumped into the SaaS space at Rubler into a kind of VP of sales and operations. So kind of running the sales team, the implementation team, managed services team, um, offshore support team as well, and launching a partnership program in there. Um, and then made the move from Rubla over to IntelliHR, where I jumped into a head of CS for APAC um, and kind of took over a really high-performing customer success, customer implementation team and a really people-focused uh, business. So that was a really cool change for me. Um, and then just kept evolving from there. So then I moved into a global head of partnerships role for inside IntelliHR and most recently, we were acquired by Human Force. And through that acquisition, um, I my role kind of evolved again and, and moved over to the UK to focus primarily on the partnership program here. Excellent. Welcome welcome to the world of the ever-evolving ever startup, scale-up SaaS environment where you are you're constantly having to adapt and, and find new avenues to improve yourself. It's it's been a uh, it's been a really uh, a really impressive journey, as you said. We you know we we first met um, back at you know in Rubler days when you were the, the VP of Sales uh, and Operations there, and you know it's it's you've you've come a long way since then. Obviously, you know heading up now the global partner or the, the partnerships throughout UK and Europe. Uh, it's a, it's an exciting initiative, but you know diving into you know the the details of a partnership uh, partnership strategy and and how you know detailed that can be. Why don't you know? We all know that setting up a partner program, you can't do it yourself. You can't come in as a partner manager and expect to make all these all the, the sweeping changes across uh, across the board. Um, so, how do you go about getting this off the ground within a software company? You know, working cross departmentally, you know, in different in different areas, and bringing people into the fold to help uh, launch the program. Yeah, like it's it's a tricky question, right? Because it really depends on the maturity of a product. It depends on the maturity of a program, where you're kind of starting out and and what that looks like. Um, I've, a lot of people kind of start with partnerships and they go, oh, we're going to hire a partner manager and we're going to just get in all these new leads. It's going to be a new revenue stream for us without really putting much thought into what they're actually hoping to achieve out of the program. And like with the benefit of hindsight, when we launched what, well, the partnership program at Rubler was all about just let's just get the brand out there. Let's just get more logos on and the leads will just come. And, you know, you can you can partner with 100 people and 100 companies in a year and you can get zero leads because it's it's so much more than 
putting a, I guess, a logo on the, on the website. So when I moved into the partnership role at Intelli, we had the benefit of being a point solution. So a lot of businesses already wanted to integrate with us and wanted to partner with us. And we had some great existing relationships already. Um, but my focus really was about how can we make our customers' lives easier? Obviously coming from the CS side of things, we saw so many requests coming through for, hey, can you integrate with this? Or, hey, can you work with this platform? Um, so I wanted to leverage everyone in the business first before kind of developing a strategy and developing a plan. So I wanted to talk to the people who were experiencing the most pain. And that was sales because we didn't have the integrations. It was customer success who were getting constantly asked complex questions on, hey, how could we integrate with this? And where would the data flow? And how would that work? And how does this actually work within our processes? And then the support team. So it was kind of understanding where all the pain points were in the business first and what, and most importantly, what did our customers actually want from a, a from a partner or from a partner channel? And for me, the focus then became, okay, well, we need people who can support customers with creating integrations. So uh, IntelliHR, thankfully, has probably one of the best APIs I've, I've seen, really. Always helps, um, doesn't it? So, it really does. So if you're trying to create a partnership program in a SaaS space with a and with not a public API, you're you need to kind of either understand how you're going to launch that strategy or what that strategy looks like. Um, so we we partnered with what we call kind of solution partners, whereby they work with the customers, they look at our API, they look at the vendors' API, and actually sort out how they can integrate the two systems successfully without having to burden our development resources. And that was a great revenue stream for them, but also it was something that we could then say to customers, hey, here is a here's a solution that we can solve for you, that we can actually help. Um, and then it also helped start to de-risk the sales cycle because we were losing deals from not having integrations. Um, and then really focusing on the, the tech vendors that we had high requests coming through from customers and actually going to them and saying, hey, we've got all of these mutual customers. They're constantly requesting integration. Can we work on something together? And it's mutually beneficial for them, right? Their customers become stickier because they're integrating with the HR system. Yep. Uh, our customers become happier because, you know, they're not having to do 10 hours of manual data entry, which is the complete opposite of implementing a SaaS platform, right? Like you want to automate, you want to innovate and you want to free up your teams. So it was all about kind of making sure that the teams were set up for success and finding those pain points so we could solve it. Yeah. Um, more than kind of just slapping a logo on the website and going, yeah, cool, we've done it. We've made a partner program. Because you're, you're right. It, it is probably the the, the most common mis misconception when launching a new partner strategy. It's just, you know, we'll, we'll bring on 100 logos and the rest will take care of itself. But, you know, we know from a, a traditional, you know, outbound strategy or, you know, you've got your SDRs, your AEs, and then your customer success managers, you can't have a team of sales professionals and then expect the customers to just understand the product without that ongoing support. So um, it is probably the, the biggest misconception, but do you have anything else to add on that? You know, you've, you've seen a few different partner strategies now. Where do people seem to fall down the most when setting up, you know, launching a new SaaS-based partner strategy? Honestly, the biggest part of it is enablement. It's actually setting up the partners for success, first and foremost, helping them understand the product, helping them understand your value proposition, but also helping your internal teams understand the partner's value proposition and understanding how we can leverage their software to help our customers as well. So a lot of my focus, and I don't know whether this is just the operational background or the customer success side of it, that, that I really wanted to focus on enablement. Um, because the biggest advocates in the business for a partner program are not going to be your sales team. They're going to be the people who are day in, day out implementing the product with customers, the ones that have a strong relationship with those customers, like support, and being able to speak from a place of trust and, I guess, a little bit more authority as well. So when we launch, every time we get a new partner on, we kind of do a session with the entire team. So that's sales, implementation, support, and we make sure that they understand the partner's value proposition first and foremost. And we make sure that the partners or teams obviously understand our value proposition as well, because you always forget, you know, the first thing we do is we get a partnership program, we do a demo to, it's usually the partner manager, maybe some of the sales teams, and then that's it. Yeah. And as a sales team, they have one goal, that is get revenue into the business as rapidly as possible. They've got sales targets to hit. They don't care how that happens. 
but they need to get money in the door. Whereas your customer success team is so much more focused on, hey, what are the solutions that we can add? Where's the value that we can add? Uh, so a lot of what we introduced straight away was actually saying, well, during our kickoffs with our customers, what, what tech stack are you using? What are you, what are you already using for applicant tracking? What are you already using for your learning management system? And getting those conversations out early and actually surfacing where we as a business could help our partners. Um, because at the end of the day, it's, it's all about not only getting leads in for us, but it's getting leads in for them because the more we help them and the more we connect with those partners and actually say, Hey, we've actually got a customer here that we think is a perfect fit for you. That reciprocity starts to happen and they go, Oh, actually I do have a customer that needs HR and I'm going to talk to these guys because I've already worked with them. I've done the implementation with them. We know it's high quality. Uh, so it's, it's yep. more about really setting those teams up for success because they're in the trenches day in, day out, having those conversations. Yeah. Perfect. And I know you, you did mention it and I, and I know, you know, creating a win-win environment and, and providing, um, a, you know, you're big on reciprocity and making sure that, you know, leads are coming in, but also leads, uh, are going out. Can you share a bit more about how you manage this? You know, because I think I do believe that the partnership ecosystem has evolved over the last five or six years where it used to be bring on some referral partners and we'll just bleed them dry for as many leads as we possibly can. We'll give them a 15% commission on closed deals and that should be enough, you know, to sweeten the deal for them. But we've evolved so much and we understand now that it is a win-win. Can you elaborate a bit more on how you manage this both internally with stakeholder management and also externally with those partners? Yeah, for sure. It's, it's, takes a lot of work and it's a lot of um I've learned a lot by mistakes so and just kind of starting things and going oh actually that didn't work and this role that didn't work very well but a lot of what we do is actually almost run an, a new partnership like a project so we use Asana as a project management tool we give them access we kind of go through our, our partner onboarding almost give them access to resources like our understanding our ICP understanding our ideal fit what we as a business are about um, and then we've also then leveraged platforms like Reveal. So Reveal is, it's a free platform. So, you know, if you are just starting out, it's great because you can hook it into Salesforce and then you can start to do data mapping between the two platforms. So uh, what I wanted to focus on was to set our partnership program apart from other vendors who are just kind of partnering and not really doing much else. So as soon as we did the the cross, uh, like the actual mapping between the two businesses, I'd go through our customer base versus their prospect pipeline and their open deals and started reaching out to the customer success managers on our side and then the salesperson and the partner side and saying, hey, these guys are a current customer of ours. Is there anything we can do to help you during the sales cycle? Is there anything that we can start to bring up in training sessions or is there anything that we can do to support you to get this over the line faster? And that has, that made the biggest impact to our program. It's the, you can't just kind of say, oh, we've got a, we've got a 15% referral. That's going to solve it. Because at the end of the day, that doesn't motivate the salespeople to do anything. It, it's great. It might be a revenue stream for the business if you're tracking it properly. Um, but tracking those referrals, making sure they get paid out is, is a really big job. So we actually started to work with partners and not even have the referral bits in place. It was more about, hey, let's just have a an agreement that we want to work together, have an NDA in place. Yep. And then we incentivized the sales reps directly. So we leverage the software. We work really closely with the sales teams. We create the Slack channels with the sales teams as well so that they've kind of got a direct line to us. And then we start actually helping them make revenue first. And then we then we then we focus on the other side, which is, hey, we would also like to bring in deals here. Yep. Um, but that piece is so much easier when you've, you're have you coming from a place of trust. You've already got a couple of success stories. Um, we worked really closely with um, JobAdder when I kind of first started and we went and found a really great mutual customer. And with the first thing I said was, let's get a great case study out there. And we put out yeah. a really good, really strong case study about the efficiencies they had and what they were able to achieve with the, with the integration in place. And that was our marketing team drove that. So it's, more about, hey, let's give all the resources that you need. Let's make sure it's set up for success. And then the rest starts to take care of itself naturally without having to do so much kind of, you know, monthly meetings saying, hey, have you got me any leads? Have you, yeah. you know, what have you got in the pipeline? Like there's nothing worse than being a partner manager on, at, at, at another business. And I get it all the time from partners kind of being like, hey, can you send us leads this week? Like, like what have you got? 
And it's it's more about focusing on, hey, what can we do to help you? What do you need from us? Yep. Really. Yeah. So it's really b- about building, you know, a long term mutually beneficial um, strategy that both parties can, you know, we've both led sales teams in the past and it's hard enough to get them motivated to sell the product and, and, and receive their small amount of commission, let alone a really heavily subsidized piece of commission from a partner that they might not even see anything of. So how do you get them to focus on selling your product outside of selling their own where they get, you know, they want to put food on the table. So they've got to sell their own product first and then, try and send you leads as well it, it's it's really tough to do so i think that's a that's a really great strategy of of working you know having a, a mutually you know not even talking about any kind of commission splits or anything like that it's just mutual partnership ndas and then working directly with the sales teams and, and creates a, a a really powerful environment of of cross collaboration and sharing of leads i think that's fantastic and you did touch on reveal um you know as something that you use and, and it is it is a, a fantastic product is there anything else that you use internally to, to manage your process? You mentioned Salesforce. Do you use the, the Salesforce add-on for partnerships? We don't know. So I guess being in the startup vibe, it was very much, hey, do more with less. So yeah. we, I wanted to leverage the tools that we had. I, we kind of created a custom layout in Salesforce for partnerships so we could track everything. But from an internal enablement piece, my big focus was, hey, let's make sure everything's documented. So every integration that was built or everything that a partner built, we made sure that we've had that on our own internal knowledge base. It also has kind of backlinks to their websites. It's got UTM links nested in there as well. So if our customers do go there and then go to the partner website, we can track that or they can track that for lead attribution as well. Um, but the big thing that we added in that made the most difference was adding Asana. Like it's, it's just a project management tool. It's, and you can jump in and you can ask questions and we put links into every, all of our content library, um, everything that we needed there. And then all of our call reportings and trainings as well that we would do with the partner. So they always had access. Um, and it was kind of like this quick, easy way for the partner managers and the teams to jump in and then on because we can obviously use Slack Connect and then we'd pin it to the top of the Slack channel so that, you know, there's always a, a way for them to, to review the content and, and understand everything as well. Yeah. Um, the big focus for us was was making sure we leveraged that, but also incentivizing the sales reps. So we did that through like a $250 gift card if they sent a qualified sales qualified lead um, over to, to the business and then, we would also kind of keep an eye on that and track that for them as well, because your sales reps are much more incentivized to do something than the business is to say, Oh, make sure you send leads to Intelli because we get 10% revenue split. Like they're much more willing to push that because Hey, they get a benefit straight away just by introducing us if it's qualified. Yeah. It's amazing how much a, a $50 or a hundred dollar Coles Meyer gift voucher will, will do to, to incentivize a sales rep. It's, um, they, they love it and, it and it works beautifully for everyone. And then, so you did mention um, a sales qualified lead. Do you, obviously, you know, you, you run a, a very, you know, tight gauntlet of offering gift cards for for every lead because they might just send you any, anything, uh, mum and dad, the baker, uh, anyone. So do you you go through the normal and, and as a partner or as the, the head of partnerships, do you vet those yourself? Do you pass them to the sales team and then they go through their, their qualification quite qualification criteria how how is that sort of process run yeah typically because i guess i have a background in sales i didn't want to send bad leads to reps so the we made sure that the caveat was they had to be sales qualified leads in order to be eligible because obviously you don't want all of these leads coming through that are not high quality um and that we really only kind of did that with kind of new partners where we weren't super sure just yet of the quality that may come through or we weren't confident in the training aspect yet or they weren't far enough through their onboarding but once they have a once they kind of got through the end of their onboarding we would typically then just send that either straight to the uh, SDR team or our outbound function or straight to the AEs depending on on how well qualified it was but we would typically ask you know a lot of information primarily decent handover notes to understand you know what where the conversation's at where they are in the funnel like where their decision making process is at and if it's the right stakeholder that we're actually engaging with yeah um, so it was a very big focus on making sure it was qualified. I 
definitely don't do the same level of um, kind of jumping in there now. Uh, but historically, when we would start new ones, it would very much be, hey, let's just double check. I'll have a quick kind of discovery session with this with this lead and just make sure that we're not going to waste the reps time. Because at the end of the day, if you put a bad lead in front of a sales rep from a partner, the next time they get one, even if it is the hottest lead you've ever seen, they're going to go, oh, I don't know if I trust this. Yep. And you want to make sure that you're starting the team off on a strong foot as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mutual trust is, is something else that doesn't really get spoken about. You know, you have to make sure that, you know, your sales team want those leads and they're willing to nurture and, and work them through. We all know that partnership leads close at a higher ratio and ACVs are generally higher and blah, 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 blah. But if, if you get one burnt sales rep, they just won't take anything else on. And so- and, and what's next for for Human Force and for yourself? Like, tell us a little bit more about Human Force, and I suppose you know now's your now's your your chance to sort of pitch, you know, who your ideal partner is. You know, someone sitting here watching this video and they go, "Oh, I actually, you know, that'd be great to partner with Human Force and and work closely with Kate." Oh, look, I mean, what's what's not to what's not to love other than working with me? No, um, it's it, realistically that program now is very much about um, that highly integrated kind of best in breed, but also working closely with kind of implementation partners and, and payroll partners as well. So given that we're now kind of had that highly integrated piece with HR and workforce management, obviously in Australia, we've got, um, they've got white label um, payroll solution where, that kind of resell that end to end solution. The focus here in the UK is very much around kind of combating the all-in-one bias at the moment because the market maturity is a little, probably a little bit behind where Australia is at the moment. Okay. So I guess for us, the, the really big focus is is actually working with platforms like applicant tracking, learning management systems and payroll systems to offer a holistic solution for, for customers to be able to combat that all-in-one bias that the market seems to have leaned heavily into post COVID. They're like, oh, well, it's fine because it's cheaper, but it's also the quality is just not there for all yep. of, with all in ones at the moment. And so it's, it's very much a focus on kind of developing the partnership program holistically for human force, as opposed to just the HR function or just the workforce management function now. Yeah. Fantastic. Cause you know, you, you're right. There are some, some companies out there that claim to be an all in one, but you know, it's almost akin to a, a Frankenstein model where there's, you know, nothing works and even internally it doesn't communicate. So that makes total sense. And you did touch on, you know, the major differences. Obviously, you've been in leadership roles here in Australia and you've been heavily involved in this landscape. And, you know, I don't want to put you on the back foot because you've only been in the UK for, you know, a, a couple of months. But is there anything, you touched on one one area, but is there anything else in particular that you've found has been a, a really stark difference? Uh, and this this could apply for for SaaS companies looking to launch into the UK region that could be quite beneficial. Is there any major differences you've found between selling or partnering in the APAC region versus UK EMEA area? Yeah, there's, there is a massive difference. First of all, there's the cost of acquisition for leads in this region. Um, the competitive landscape is, is, is much more intense because you've got, you know, a lot of the American providers, as well as you kind of your European and your UK providers, all trying to grab the same kind of set of space. So cost of acquisition for leads here, I've noticed is, is in, is a lot higher, but also the quality isn't coming through as much. So there is a lot more of a, I guess, a, a leaning towards a partner program because, They've realized, and a lot of businesses are in the same spot, like the amount of companies I've spoken to in the last kind of couple of months where they've said, look, we're just not getting the lead quality at the moment. Everything, like doesn't matter how much we're spending on ads or how much we put through LinkedIn, we're just not getting the quality. Right. So it's very much a partner-led strategy over here at the moment because of the fact that you're just having to pay so much for the same kind of lead. Whereas if you're going to go 250 quid for a, a qualified lead from a partner, that's still going to be half the cost of an acquisition for a borderline unqualified lead that you're getting through paid spend. Yep. Um, so that's been a really big kind of shift. We were lucky enough, the way we were launched in telly was actually through a reseller or a channel partner, which is kind of half the reason why I came over in the first place, which okay. is very much a focus on, they they essentially resell our products, they're a payroll solution. And there was a lot of work that kind of went into making sure that that was set up for success and so much enablement kind of making sure that worked, but it allowed us to understand the market 
understand the, what we needed to fit in the market before we kind of launched fully into the UK. Yeah, wow. No, it's it, it is true. I've worked in organisations in the past, and you know we have launched into the UK through through channel. Um, you know, the US is a little bit different. You can still manage a direct market at the moment. Um, but even that's shifting. I'm noticing a huge shift in direct versus indirect through channel. Um, but no, that's that's really good advice. I think it's, I suppose it's getting boots on the ground and getting that, we've spoken about it, that trust built earlier, which you can only develop through a partnership network, people sharing and collaborating back and forth. Um Excellent. Is there anything else I haven't touched on? Is there anything else that, you know, about you that, you know, the audience should know or, or what's, what's, uh, what, yeah, what else should they know? What is, uh, look, about me, probably not much. I think it, when it comes to partnerships, I think it's, it's very easy to, to think, oh, we're just going to try and generate revenue and that's all we need to focus on. We're just trying to generate leads. Um, I think the big focus, whenever you're trying to launch a partnership channel or launching a program, it has to be a focus on, what is the business actually need or what do your customers actually need and what are you trying to achieve before you kind of go out and just just to kind of go through every avenue and then go, oh, actually, what have we done? And now you're not resourced well enough to actually to, to actually facilitate what you're trying to do. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really a much more, uh, it needs to be a much more sophisticated strategy than just adding logos onto the website or just trying to get in leads as, as many as possible. Yeah. And, and on that, has your success criteria changed at all? You know, obviously I, I don't know what your initial criteria was, whether it was logos on board or, or revenue, but has that changed? And, and do you see that changing over the next quarter, two quarters at all? Yeah, it definitely has changed. I think when we first launched the program, it was very much about, hey, how can we increase mid funnel conversions and how can we just have more qualified leads into the pipeline? Um, and that still is very, very much the focus, but it's over here when we're, we're trying to do brand recognition as well, we're relatively unknown in the market. So the focus for us right now is actually getting business out there, getting the name out there a little bit more and actually being able to get a bit more brand trust and brand recognition in market. And then obviously trying to figure out how we can pull in leads off the back of that as well. Yeah. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, Kate, that's been an absolute pleasure um, having a chat with you today. I, uh, I really appreciate your time and, and thanks for gracing us on this on this gloomy UK day. I'm sure you'll uh, I'm sure you'll adapt pretty quickly. I think you'll have to. Oh, wow. how, how long are you over there for? Is it a bit of a, a permanent thing? Uh, it's a 12-month secondment at the moment, so likely back in Australia probably for the next 12 months, but uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll get used to the gloomy weather and want to stay a little longer. Yeah. So we'll, we'll we'll soon see. Ah, very good. Excellent. Well, uh, I really appreciate your time. Thank you for jumping on the call. And uh, yeah, we'll definitely chat again soon. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time. Don't forget to follow Crux PRM on LinkedIn or cruxhq.com to register as a guest.